welcome to the untold with heavy buzo today we will be talking about the current situation in iraq the new iraqi government and the attempt by Kadhimi, the new iraqi prime minister to confront iranian militias in iraq and the current turkish attacks on iraqi kurdistan joining us to talk about this bilal wahab who is a fellow at the washington institute for near eastern affairs and douglas olivant senior fellow at New America. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. I do want to start with you, Douglas. Uh, you are a retired Army officer. You served uh, as a director for Iraq and the National Security Council during the, both uh, the Bush and the Obama administration. I want you to tell me, how do you see the change in the policy by the current administration, and how do you assess uh, these new policies towards Iraq? Well, I think the reason it's often hard to determine what the administration's policy towards Iraq is, is I think there are two of them. Um, and there are two Iraq policies battling it out inside the administration, each of which has champions. One policy is the policy the United States has had for almost 15 years, that once a free, democratic, independent Iraq that's an ally in the war on terror and not a, and not a issue or a threat to its neighbors. Um, that is a long-standing U.S. policy, and part of this administration is in continuity with that. Um, there is another part of this administration that sees Iraq policy as an adjunct to its Iran policy, um, and the most a, a certain wing of which then sees Baghdad as occupied territory, as already an Iranian satrapy, um, and therefore that Iraq is a logical place in which to fight your, uh, your disagreements with the Iranians. But these, these two policies battle it out internally. Um, as I used to tell my Iraqi friends, it was the one policy that got Iraq put on the, uh, the so-called uh, you know, Muslim ban list, and it was the other policy that got them taken off. Uh, and so you can see that policy intention inside the administration. How do you assess uh, the current policy, Bilal? Because we definitely did see a shift, um, and we do see the weakening of the Iranian-backed militias. But in general, how do you assess the policies by this administration towards Iraq? Uh, actually, Doug put it pretty well uh, and eloquently that, uh, you know, uh, it, it's more of a battle within the current administration, uh, you know, a, a battle for continuity and change. Uh, there is another way of looking at the same question, uh, and this is uh, something that my colleague at the Washington Institute uh, put, Mike Knights, uh, that uh, you know, Iraq was seen by parts of the administration uh, as uh, one of the, you know, um, one of the wars, one of the, uh, the uh, you know, the, the endless wars that Trump wants to end in the Middle East. Uh, and then other parts of the administration see it as a uh, opportunity to confront Iran whereby Iraq becomes a, uh, you know, a battleground, so to speak, in the uh, maximum pressure campaign. Uh, so along the lines of uh, uh, what Doug mentioned, I think the U.S. is in a way at a loss as to what they really want in Iraq. Uh, do they want to contribute to this country where there's a history with all of its ups and downs? Uh, my take on this is that the U.S. has always had, uh, as policies go, an extremist policy in Iraq. They either, you know, went in, with, uh, let's say, a war of 1991, and 1990, 1991, the, the Gulf War, or then complete disengagement, other than like every missile every now and then, or maybe some air surveillance, and that was the 1990s. 2003, uh, all-out invasion, and then in 2000 and uh, end of 2011, then a, a full uh, withdrawal. Uh, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, oscillation between two extremes has really confused U.S. policy, but also Iraq policy, and then, uh, sorry, uh, the Iraqi government attitude toward the United States, and therefore the relationship between the two. What has been missing is a normal relationship between two countries uh, that is not only a security relationship, but you know, includes economic relationship, trade, cultural exchange, diplomatic uh, you know, exchange that is not put in danger by, in the case of the U.S. Milit uh, diplomatic presence in Baghdad, by parts of the Iraqi government. And that was the, the, the framework of the 2018 um, uh, SFA, the strategic uh, framework uh, uh, agreement between the, the two countries. Obviously that was 
um, in a way interrupted by the U.S. withdrawal and then again by the uh, ISIS attack and invasion of part of Iraq. But perhaps with the dialogue that you started your questions with, there is an opportunity to put this Iraq-U.S. relationship uh, back on, on a normal track. And if I could just jump in, Bilal makes yes. a really important point. You know, the, as I said, the U.S. policy towards Iraq is bifurcated, almost bipolar. But in turn, the Iraqi policy towards the United States is just all over the map. Iraq has no idea corporately what kind of relationship it wants to have with the United States. Um, and so the United States with its bipolar policy and Iraq with almost an absence of policy makes it very, very difficult for the two states to figure out just how they should interact with each other. Well, that's an important point. But, you know, now we have a new government in Iraq. You wrote a piece, Douglas, about that we should be or have modest expectations from this government. How do you view the performance of Kadami? We know that he did things that were not done before, um, such as arresting the Qatar of Hezbollah members. We know that they were released later, but making this type of step, that was a change in how we've uh, been seeing the previous prime ministers of Iraq behave. So obviously, Prime Minister Khatami is um, certainly a favorite of the West. He is known to almost every American who does Iraq policy, uh, has long and good relations with the West. And is essentially seen by both his friends and, Amer and his enemies as the U.S.'s guy. So he, he does have that, and he is doing things that we like to see. Um, you know, he has, you know, got made, gone up to Mosul and, and reached out to the people there and talked to them about the suffering that they've encountered. Um, he has confronted uh, Iraqi Hezbollah, as you've pointed out. But I think we need to... He can push against the margins, but I would describe these things as mostly symbolic politics and pushing against the margins. When it comes to the fundamental issues of Iraqi policy, he's limited by two things. First, he's in the middle of a crisis, and he's going to need political unanimity to deal with the twin crises of COVID and the low oil prices that have decimated the Iraqi economy and the Iraqi budget. So he really doesn't have the luxury of taking on a major political faction. He needs everyone focused on this crisis. Um, and uh, secondly, he just doesn't have much time and he doesn't have his own political base. So he doesn't have time to develop his own political base. Now, economy as the prime minister, um, for that matter, Barham Saleh as the president and Hal Busi as the speaker is just about the best result in terms of the individuals at the head that we could have hoped for. The West, speaking largely, could have hoped for. But the stubborn political reality is that the two largest blocks in the Iraqi par in the, in the Iraqi parliament are the Sadrists and the Fatah party that represents these Iranian militias the you know, Iranian aligned militias. So that's a really stubborn political fact that it's gonna be very, very hard for Prime Minister Khatami to navigate around. Again, he can make important symbolic gestures. And I think these arrests were one, his uh, reaching out to the various factions uh, is another. But uh, in terms of real fundamental policy, one, he doesn't have much time two, he doesn't have his own political base, and three, he has crises to deal with uh, that are going to consume almost all of his attention. Now we, we listen to what Douglas is saying about the situation in Iraq and that the fact that there is a crisis currently as well on top of the other elements. But to the Iranian-backed militias in Iraq, we saw what Qais al-Khaza'ali, who is the head of Asaib Ahl al-Haq, how he basically threatened Qadami after what he'd done with the Qatar Hezbollah. He had the Iraqi flags behind him rather than uh, their militia flags, which usually is the case, they feel threatened. In your opinion, even if this, as Douglas said, is symbolic because th those people were released afterwards, doesn't that indicate a change in what's happening in Iraq under this uh, new government? I agree with Doug that, uh, you know, politically, the, uh, the militias, be it on the southern side or be it on the, on the Fatah side, are well entrenched. Uh, but the recent behavior shows perhaps weakness, 
division within, lots of fracture going on. And, uh, you know, the death of Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis in particular has really shattered the leadership system where different, you know, personalities are, are vying for the top job, you know, to replace uh, Muhandis on one hand. But also, uh, they were the, the, the militia groups and, and, and the Iran project in Iraq uh, was really shaken by the protest movement. I mean, this was not, you know, induced in the, you know, by, by the Sunnis. This was not, the protest movement, you know, did not occur in Kurdistan or, or in Ambar. They were in Basra, they were in Diqar, they were in, you know, in the deep, you know, Shia South, uh, mostly. And then, of course, in Baghdad. And I think that is a very strong message to the Shia leadership in Iraq, but also to Iran. These are areas that Iran and the, the Shia class, the Shia political class, have very little excuse to explain why poverty rate in Muthanna is 55%. That has not been sectarian war in Muthanna, you know, or in Basra, you know, 25%, or, or in, you know, in, uh, in, in Dhiqar, 45%. These are areas, you know, towns and provinces that, you know, Basra accounts for 80% of Iraqi oil production. Uh, they didn't have civil war. They were not part of the, the insurgency. The Al-Qaeda wasn't all that active there. And they were far away and remote from all ISIS activities. So when you have poverty rates in double digits, that is the utter uh, failure of, of Shia rule and Shia politics in Iraq. And then the public also sees like who is the patron of these groups? How can they, you know, have such a, a bad, you know, uh, horrible performance and still get away with it? How come that no one can hold them accountable? Oh, the answer is easy. Oh, because they have a very strong patron who is protecting them militarily and politically, and that's Iran. And that's the ire of the public was targeted not only at the headquarters of the you know militias and political parties, but also at the you know uh, Iranian symbols and pictures and and uh, and consulates. Uh, so that is, I think, uh, an, an important dynamic. And then you can see, yes, Qais al Khaz Ali uh, comes out and may, issues a statement from. Uh, uh, you know, with an Iraqi flag behind him, but no one has seen Qais al-Khaz Ali since January uh, 3rd. Uh, no one has seen him in person. Uh, the guy has been in hiding, and he issues statements via, you know, uh, uh, WhatsApp uh, messages, and that's about it. So you can also see into, into that. He, uh, Asaib also unilaterally shut down all of their offices to preempt any public attacks on their offices. So I think, I think that project, while they're not gone, the, the, the Iran driven project in Iraq, while it's not defeated, while they're still powerful and they have a lot of tools at their disposal, I think they are on their back foot. What do you think, Douglas, of the current situation of the Iranian-backed militias to add to what Bilal is saying about the fact that they are weaker on the leadership uh, part, they are in hiding, even though we know that they are continuing to, you know, if we talk about the Iraqi protests, the assassinations and the killings of activists, of people who are on social media, the protesters, it's continuing. Um, I wish I could be as sanguine as Bilal, but I'm not. Um, I see no evidence, real evidence. Yes, we have not seen case for several months, and yes, Muhandis is dead, and that's certainly not nothing. Um, but in terms of their political power, their economic power, um, their ability to project military power across the country, I see no signs that the the Hashid movement has lost any significant amount of power. I and mean, it's difficult for me to see that happening given the current political reality. Um, what this all comes down to is the next election, whether that's in late 2021 or early 2022. If all these demonstrators who were out there in the various squares and all those towns that Bilal mentioned and more uh, go out and vote, well, then that could bring about a different result. If we see the same type of thing where we see only the strong patronage networks, the Sadrists, the Hashid, um, you know, the, 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 the two Kurdish parties up in the north, some Sunni political machines, if they're the only ones who turn out their voters, then we need to just expect more of the same. When you talked about the economical power that they have, I mean, Iran itself is collapsing economically. The economy in Iraq is also in a very uh, tough place because of the prices of oil. So how is this impacting these militias and obviously the ongoing protests and the unrest inside of Iraq? 
What is the impact of all of those elements on the Iraqi state in general and these militias within? I'll take a stab at that. Uh, I mean, look, uh, the militias in Iraq uh, have uh, acquired uh, sort of two of the three-legged stools of power. Uh, one of them is the military acumen. Uh, they have the street creds. The war against ISIS gave them some credibility by you know, fighting ISIS, holding territory and allowing the Iraqi army or the, you know, CTC, the counterterrorism service to go and, 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 you know, liberate Mosul. So they have that, that kind of credibility. And uh, they also managed to translate that military acumen into the second leg of the stool. And that was uh, the 2018 elections, translate those into votes, into seats. And that's why, you know, as they started, uh, the makeup of the Iraqi parliament really changed with the 2018 elections. Before 2018, the Iraqi parliament was controlled by political parties, you know, the Dawa party, the, uh, you know, uh, Iski, sort of the, the traditional Iraqi opposition groups that came back after 2003. But two major Shia militia-led alliances now control the Iraqi parliament and the political, the classical traditional political parties are taking a backseat. They're not out, but they're taking a backseat. That was the second stool, translate the military record into a into a political power. The third leg was always missing for them, and that is what 2018, 19, and that's why you know we think that Adel Abdel Mahdi's tenure was so detrimental to stability in Iraq. That they really managed to translate their political, sorry, their military and newly gained uh, uh, political power into economic power. So many militias, for example, today control border crossings. Uh, they tap into the government, into ministries, into government contracts. Uh, and, and that is what made uh, the, 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 the militias, A, very powerful, and B, entrenched and dangerous. And, uh, you know, as, as, as Doug mentioned in the answer to the, 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 uh, you know, the last question, what is happening today is that that economic leg is shaking and is weakening. And while that may weaken the Shia militias, but it also makes them more dangerous because then they revert to, you know, more nasty uh, politicking in parliament where they're still powerful and they, they still have the numbers absent uh, new fresh elections. And also go back into more of the organized crime and violent tactics that allow them to intimidate politicians, intimidate uh, civil society groups, but above all, intimidate businesses and therefore curtail Iraq's opportunity to attract not only foreign investment, but also domestic uh, investment. So in a way, it's a kind of a catch-22, you know, damned if they manage to tap into Iraqi oil wealth and resources and government contracts, but also damned if they don't because they, they engage in more crime. Do you want to add anything, uh, Douglas, about the economy? Be because we know that also, you know, the prices of oil are dropping and nobody's expecting to see them rise back to where they used to be, given the situation that's happening in the world. The one thing I know is that trying to predict future oil prices is a, is a fool's errand, so I'm not going to do that. But it certainly doesn't look like they're going back to where they used to be. Um, but I'm going to disagree with Bilal and, and you a little bit. The, the fortunes of these militias, and we call them Iranian, but that's really you know, not quite accurate. Uh, my co-author Erica Gaston and I wrote a piece about this some months ago. You know, these groups aren't Iranian, and they're really not even Iranian-backed anymore. The Iranians have no money to give them, but these groups really don't need it. They've developed their own funding sources. They've become independent. They're not so much Iranian-backed as they see the world the same way the Iranians see them. They're allies more than proxies. Um, but regardless, uh, they have certainly diversified their funding sources. I don't think any of these groups have depended on the Iranians for some time. They have a wide diversity of funding sources. They are all over Iraq, controlling the border crossings and various trading points, as Paul pointed out. Uh, they have their fingers into government contracting, uh, which is the, uh, you know, the corruption there is the campaign finance system for Iraq's political parties. So as they joined that political system, they were able to tap into that funding source. Uh, and these groups all run organized crime ranks. I mean, it is an open secret which militia controls which sectors of Baghdad and who controls the drugs, the gun running, the prostitution, the shakedown rings um, all around Baghdad and other major cities. So 
I don't see them being very impacted, frankly, by Iran's woes or even by low oil prices. Many of their funding sources are very resistant to these commodity uh, fluctuations, um, and they'll be able to do just fine. What do you believe uh, the impact will be of the United States downsizing troops in Iraq? Uh, Douglas doesn't agree that it is a weakening situation of the Iranian um, infiltration of Iraq. Bilal might disagree, but in general, when the United States obviously has more leverage, when it is in Iraq, we saw with the Obama administration pulling out of Iraq caused a catastrophe for the country and for the region with the rise of ISIS and obviously the complete domination of the Iranian-backed elements within Iraq. How do you believe that this new a decision to downsize troops in Iraq would impact the ongoing situation? Well, the downsizing of U.S. troops in Iraq was inevitable. You know, they are there as part of the anti-ISIS coalition. You know, and the virtue of the anti-ISIS coalition is that it is remarkably uncontroversial. Everyone hates ISIS. Um, you know, the Gulf states hate ISIS, the Europeans hate ISIS, the Americans hate ISIS. We can build a lot of consensus around building a coalition to counter ISIS. Once ISIS is gone and we all start to, with a wink, wink, nod, nod, say, well, now the American troops are really there to keep an eye on the Iranians, well, all kinds of people start to drop off of that coalition. Um, that is a much less... Um, non-controversial coalition because you, you know at the core you've got america and the saudis and emiratis and the israelis are really the only ones who have this really hardcore possibly the uk as well uh hardcore view of the iranians and it's well known that the french and other european are a little more dovish on the proper approach to to iran so this coalition starts to break down so it's no surprise that now that ISIS is largely on its back feet, uh, now that they're largely reduced to banditry and a few raids here and there, that this coalition would start to dissipate um, and that the, the presence would be smaller. A lot of the force was there directly to fight the Iranians. You don't need artillery batteries there to shell prepared defensive positions when ISIS no longer fights in that manner. A lot more people, I believe, in the entire region believe that Iran is as dangerous, if not more dangerous than ISIS, because it does, at a state level, sponsor extremism, including Al-Qaeda in its history. It actually did create the atmosphere for ISIS to rise with uh, fueling uh, sectarian war in the region. So, I mean, there, that's another question. I would like Bilal to comment on this. The fact that the United States is actually having a tougher policy towards Iran in general definitely weakened Islamic extremism as a whole, and not only the Iranian regime and its back, other Islamist militias. Um, I mean, I go back to, uh, you know, the dichotomy that uh, I believe it was Kissinger who said Iran has to make up its mind. Is it the cause or is it the country? Uh, and I, uh, I think the Iranians don't have to choose. They can be both. Uh, and they have no qualms about, uh, <clears throat> you know, allying with, you know, secular groups. I mean, there are, uh, there are now Christian militias in Iraq that are Iran aligned and, you know, that's seen as completely fine, perhaps. Uh, in Iraqi circles uh, that may, you know, make people in Washington, D.C. scratch their heads. Uh, so, uh, you know, the Islamic Republic has Islamic in its name. And yes, it does promote, you know, and support Islamic groups here and there, especially militants and militias. Uh, but it's not an exclusive relationship. You know, uh, Lebanon's, um, you know, Christian groups are now uh, find themselves aligned with Iran. And I think that's for the fact that Iran is both. It is a cause. It does have a, a revolutionary fervor. It wants to, uh, you know, exert influence beyond its borders. But at the same time, Iran also is, is a natural country. Uh, it has natural borders. It, it has a history as a, as a country. I mean, Ahmadinejad, when visited the Vatican uh, and met with the Pope, he didn't give him a copy of the, of the Quran. He gave him a copy of the Shahnama. Uh, you know, the, the, the sort of epitome of, uh, of Persian literature. So it is both. And uh, when it comes to how they exert their influence, they, they do both. They do have, 
you know, support groups. Uh, they finance and fund and politically support them back. Uh, different political parties, Kurds, Sunnis, and Shia. Yes, they do that. They support Islamic groups. But at the same time, they also act as a state. They use, you know, Iraq's corruption and decrepit uh, economic policy to promote Iranian exports, agriculture exports, uh, you know, plastic exports, uh, you know, because that's what the state needs. The state needs to, you know, have good exports, support its domestic economy, and also access, uh, you know, create a positive uh, a trade exchange. So Iran doesn't have to choose, Iran does both. And at times, Iran's neighbors have to also respond and deal with Iran in the same way. I mean, it's perhaps not many Iraqi you know, uh, groups, parties, including some classical uh, US allies like the Kurds have realized that, you know, they may be pro-America, but they cannot be Iran's enemy because Iran can always uh, hurt you as they did by attacking the, uh, the uh, Erbil International Airport or Harir Military Airport. And there was nothing that the United States could do to, uh, you know, to uh, protect those airports. So Iran is close by, and again, in the case of the Kurds, another example is the referendum. It was, uh, it was Qasem Soleimani who led the Iraqi army into recapturing Kirkuk from the Kurds. Uh, Iran can always hurt. It's a neighbor, it's a geographic fixture. Uh, you know, the best that Iraqi uh, politicians and Kurdish politicians can do is to watch out for Iraqi interest. They cannot be Iran's enemy. And I think that is what uh, this Washington, at least, is asking of the Iraqis, is to watch out for, for Iraqi interests and not the Iranian interests. And I think that's a fair game. Let's move on to uh, the KRG and what's happening in Kurdistan, Iraq, because we also saw recently that Turkey was attacking these Kurdish areas in Iraq. Um, we know that there was in the past that this happened against PKK elements. What is going on in the KRG-controlled areas today? If you can tell us a little bit more about the situation in these areas. I'll take an initial stab at that and uh, uh, Doug, feel free to chime in. Uh, look, the KRG like Iraq uh, is going through uh, basically a perfect storm. The COVID uh, is uh, you know, killing more and more people. Uh, the mortality rate is at 3.6% today uh, and the numbers are rising. Uh, so you, you have that kind of global phenomenon starting to hit uh, you know, Iraq and Kurdistan really harshly. You, know, you can call it you know, a, a brutal second wave, or perhaps this is the first wave that's hitting Iraq. You also have the financial crisis that's hitting Iraq and hitting the KRG even harder because of low oil prices. But in the case of the KRG, uh, the budget dispute with Baghdad uh, has really exacerbated the conflict, uh, the, sorry, the crisis, the, the uh, economic depression. The Kurdish government hasn't been able to pay salaries on time. They decided to cut salaries by 21%. And Still, despite the cuts and very deep austerity measures, it's uncertain that the KRG is able to dispense public salaries. Uh, in some towns, uh, doctors and police officers have boycotted work, and in others, they are forced to report to work, and, and how, how far can that last is just up for grabs. Uh, but also, as you mentioned, uh, Turkey and Iran have started to simultaneously ensure this, you know, they're coordinating their efforts to attack their oppositions deep within Iraqi Kurdistan. The PKK in particular started a whole new operation called uh, Operation uh, uh, Claw Tiger, in which they are, uh, you know, some 12 to 15 kilometers deep inside Iraqi Kurdistan. They're setting up more and more bases. And um, um, so far, five Iraqi Kurdish civilians have died and some 50, 60 villages uh, have been evacuated. And, you know, these are all problems that the KRG has sort of little in terms of tools in their toolkit to handle. You know, it's not a sovereign to go and borrow money. It's, uh, you know, it's not a sovereign to go and, and let's say, complain at the UN Security Council for Iranian and, and Turkish aggressions. Uh, and then the COVID is just a, you know, it's a global pandemic. Uh, however, rather than rise to the challenge, uh, Kurdistan is leading uh, parties, the KDP and the PUK, uh, are basically uh, bickering and they're engaging in, in petty political, you know, uh, games of scoring political points at each other. Uh, they refuse to meet, uh, they're trying to undermine each other's efforts, and uh, they're tapping into this regional dynamic of Turkey, Iran, you know, the Gulf Rift to, again, uh, get back at each, at each other. And that basically renders them 
less effective in Iraqi politics. You know, the KDP and the PUK have been working at cross purposes in Iraq when it, came to, when it comes to, you know, the, the doling out of positions. And be because they are weaker in Iraq and because they don't have unity at home, that just makes them less useful as a U.S. partner. What do you think about the situation, Douglas, with Iraqi Kurdistan? Well, there, I think there's two very distinct issues here. Well, the first is, you know, Iraqi Kurdistan itself. And Bilal obviously knows that far better than I do. I don't have much to add. I think he really got to the key point there that because it's not a state, it has very, very few tools to deal with this. It, it, it can't go borrow money. It can't inflate. It doesn't have currency reserves to draw against. Um, you know, all those tools that Baghdad has to deal with this crisis, it doesn't have. Um, and, and, and the KRG is just far more reliant on the salaries to maintain its economy than is the South. I mean, there's a reason that the KRG has a 3% poverty rate and the South has a 50% poverty rate, and it's because almost everyone in the KRG is on the payroll. Almost everyone or every household has a salary, is a retiree, uh, you know, you've got to hand it to the KDP and PUK. They really managed to get everyone in the KRG on the patronage network in a way that's just impossible to do with the much larger numbers in the South. When it comes to Turkey and the PKK, um, you know, the United States is in a difficult place. I mean, the PKK isn't just a, it's not just the Turks that consider the PKK a terrorist group. They're U.S. listed as a terrorist organization as well. So when the Turks make the same argument that the United States makes, that this country is not strong enough to deal with these terrorists within its borders, we're going to strike ourselves. Uh, that leaves the United States really without much to say. Okay, yeah, that's what we do. So, uh, and we saw that this week from this, I believe the Secretary of State made a, a fairly strong statement acknowledging that yes, we also consider the PKK a terrorist organization. Um, we kind of fudge what that means for the YPG and just don't talk about it. But uh, when it comes to the PKK proper inside the KRG, uh, there's, there's little, very little the United States can say about that. Are there numbers growing and what are the tools for the KRG? And I understand what you said, Bilal, about the fact that it's not a, an actual sovereign country to be able to be more flexible and confronting these elements. But in terms of the PKK existence within these KRG areas, how strong are they? Are they getting bigger, smaller? What is the situation? I'm not aware of uh, sort of added or, or, or unusual PKK activity that is you know, creating uh, sort of a Turkish backlash. Uh, part of it is seasonal. You know, this is usually the time where where Turkey attacks Kandil, uh, you know, in spring and, 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 and summer. Uh, that's one. Two, uh, Turkey is outsourcing a lot of its problems beyond its borders. You know, the economic crisis that's hitting Turkey within, obviously, the COVID, uh, but also, you know, the, the legitimacy crisis that the ruling party is going through. Uh, usually the solution to that has been, you know, to uh, engage in some military adventure. Because again, you know, it creates a rally around the flag effect. Uh, so Turkey right now is engaged in Libya, engaged in Iraq, I've also engaged in Syria. So it's militarily uh, stretched. Uh, but it seems that these military ventures have, you know, some domestic support at the time that the, uh, the ruling uh, party has very little to show uh, in terms of governance and, and a strong economy and job creation. Uh, let's also not forget that, uh, you know, the, the ruling coalition in Turkey has also changed since the, the coup attempt of, uh, of 2016. And uh, the uh, AKP is now in alliance with the MHP, which is a very, you know, nationalistic, some say anti-Kurdish political party. So that kind of uh, transborder uh, attack against the PKK is gaining, you know, get, has some, some momentum and support within the country. And the Turkish government with the media that it controls can basically sell it as an extension of the effort that Turkey is engaged in uh, in, uh, in, neighboring, in neighboring Syria. But also the Iraqi Kurdish dynamic plays into this because, uh, you know, there has been a, a change in the balance of power between the two ruling parties inside Kurdistan, the KDP and the PUK, with the KDP in ascension and PUK, uh, you know, uh, stocks falling, they lost their leader, they uh, uh, have their seats in parliament. Uh, and oftentimes the PKK and the PUK uh, find a common ground 
uh, in order to sort of rise up to, P to KDP. Now, of course, KDP has a better relationship with Turkey, thanks to energy deals, thanks to you know, uh, borders. And you know, at one point, uh, a former Iraqi Kurdistan's president participated in AK Party rally in Diyarbakir, you know, part of the sort of the Turkish effort at the time for peace and reconciliation within. So the KDP and the PKK, you know, have a lot of uh, enmity going on, and that also taps into the internal Kurdish dynamics. Uh, the PKK, too, specifically, perhaps to your question, has been more successful recruiting inside Iran more than inside Iraq, but they have, uh, they have also still managed to do enough recruitment in Iraq. But the, the main recruitment operation are mainly obviously in Syria, but also increasingly in Iran. It is interesting what you mentioned, that basically there's no need for anything to happen on the Kurdish side for Turkey to attack and then blame the PKK. So they, they do it with impunity. There's nobody verifying if it's true, the Turkish claims to the fact that there are any PKK activities or not. But what is the position of the United States in terms of what you said, Douglas, earlier about the fact that, you know, when there's a claim of the PKK who's de designated a terrorist by the United States, then there's not much to do. But why there's no uh, ways of verifying the Turkish claims also from the United States and um, to make sure that those attacks don't just happen anytime Erdogan's party and himself want to get more legitimacy inside of Turkey. This is one of the times when it's obviously, you know, the United States does not rule the world. We do not monitor the Turkish-Iraqi border for what the activities are there. Um, and, we, you know, we have to take the word of the sovereign country that's, uh, that's doing the attacks. Um, that doesn't mean we necessarily believe them. It does mean we really aren't in a position to second guess them. Bilal, you did mention also the role of Turkey in Syria, in Libya, now what's happening in Iraq, also the Kurdish side. And uh, we saw that there's a, a recent meeting with Rouhani and Putin. How do you assess this role, especially when we saw also what's happening in uh, Libya, that Turkey is basically now intervening militarily in so many countries um, with a lot of accusations of human rights violations in these places, uh, supporting Islamic elements, etc.? country for Iraq, uh, you know, for at, at one point, the KRG alone was, uh, was Turkey's, uh, I, think, I think Iraq proper was, was Iraq, was, was Turkey's second largest trade partner. Uh, you know, Turkey sees uh, uh, Iraq not only as a, as a theater for its fight against the PKK, but also as an opportunity to access perhaps cheaper energy uh, and exert uh, uh, a level of, uh, you know, influence. Uh, at one point, you know, Turkey was playing as far as balance of power goes, a balancing power vis-a-vis -vis Iran. But now Turkey is very distracted uh, with, again, you know, overstretched militarily, uh, has a lot of internal uh, difficulties. And I didn't mention that it's not just the PKK, but also politically, they're targeting the HDP, accusing it of being the political wing of the, of the PKK. But at the end of the day, Turkey is perhaps uh, you know, if, if Turkey is healthy and strong, it could be Iraq's healthiest uh, and, and most important trade partner, especially in the absence of uh, uh, lack of engagement, not, not so much absence, lack of engagement of Iraq's Arab neighbors. I do want to go back to Douglas about your point that the United States does not rule the world. When we saw what happened with the United States disengaged in the Middle East, it was a very a big disaster for the entire region. And um, even if we leave a specific region like the Middle East, it doesn't leave us. What happens is that extremist elements come out and we saw what happened under the Obama administration where you were the director of the Iraq desk at the National Security Council. It was a big, I mean, I don't know if you would call it a mistake, but I would for the United States to leave Iraq and we saw what happened with the rise of ISIS. So what is the right approach for the United States as a world leading power and the force for good to do about these uh, ongoing challenges that we are facing in the Middle East? I think the United States needs to find ways to work with countries in the region. Um, but ultimately, the countries in the region make their own decisions. Um, you, know, the, you know, it is a stubborn fact that the Iraqis in 2008 signed a withdrawal agreement with the United States that said we would withdraw in three years. 
And the Iraqis insisted on that. We did not want to sign a withdrawal agreement. We fought against it. And that was a condition imposed on us to stay for three more years. So don't be shocked when, when you sign a withdrawal agreement, you end up actually withdrawing three years later. Although I think the Iraqis had some buyer's remorse about that decision. I think, you know, we can, we can also look at, at Turkey. Um, they'll all said that, you know, Turkey could be, you know, the, the most stable partner for Iraq. I think that's absolutely the case. I think it's been made very difficult in the last four to five years because the Turks have had two major bones of contention with the United States. The first obviously being our support of the YPG in Syria and using them as our primary proxy force against ISIS inside Syria. And the second being the United States reaction to the 2016 coup, which from the Turkish perspective, um, the United States gave a, huh, let's wait and see what happens with this coup response, rather than strongly condemning the use of military force to try to overcome their elected regime. So tensions are very deep between the United States and Turkey, primarily over those two issues. There's a whole host of others, several of which flowed from those two decisions. Um, but I think what has to happen is the United States has to be able to disengage from the region, but find ways to do so responsibly. But if the countries in the region insist on having us disengage irresponsibly, then that's the way it's going to be. If the Turks don't want to talk to the United States and want to play a spoiler force in NATO, they can do that. If the Iraqis want us to leave, they can do that. Um, there are, a, you know, the United States is not responsible for everything that happens in the Middle East. And at the end of the day, these are sovereign countries and we will, for the most part, respect their decisions. You know, I do want to ask you this, Bilal, because we know that this is a national security interest of the United States. I mean, we're talking about uh, terrorist extremist groups this threatens us here at home. So isn't it also should be looked at as an interest of the United States and not because one country or a corrupt dictatorship somewhere wants us to do something that we just follow um, what they ask us to do? I mean, that is the definition of the new Washington, right? Uh, you know, uh, basically being so disappointed in the enterprise of nation building followed by the Arab Spring. Uh, the attitude nowadays is that terrorism is a problem that we can you know, uh, controlled remotely or yeah. perhaps at worst by allying with, you know, small forces, effective forces on the ground and then do, you know, buy through and with, as we saw with the Iraqi military, the Peshmerga, and in the case of Syria with the SDF. Uh, and, you know, if that's all it takes, uh, the United States has really lost the appetite for the kind of deep political engagement and nudging and, and even, you know, funding uh, civil society organizations, media organizations that really promotes uh, institutional reform, if not institution building. Uh, we'll see how, how this phase uh, in, uh, in U.S. foreign policy will play out, because the, the challenge of, of terrorism, both you know, Al-Qaeda and ISIS-like terrorism, but also state-sponsored terrorism, is still a reality, and the Middle East uh, is not on a trajectory towards stability. Um, lastly, I want to ask you about the SDF areas. Now, previously, um, the impulses of President Trump is to get out of the Middle East and endless wars. But what we're seeing now with the administration's policy with maximum pressure campaign on Iran, Syria is a very important place where Iran plays a very big role uh, in supporting the Assad regime. And now we learn that there's a new American military base in eastern Hasake, which is the SDF controlled area that has a helicopter pad, etc. What does that mean in terms of the overall policy of disengaging or engaging in a country like Syria? I'll quickly comment on the, on the SDF part and I'll let Doug uh, probably offer the, the big picture here. Uh, I think everyone is in wait and see mode. Uh, Syria is a country where multiple superpowers are at each other's throats. Uh, I don't think there is a military end game in sight. Uh, everyone is somehow waiting for a miracle. The political process isn't really moving forward. So at best, this is kind of a frozen conflict with flare-ups every now and then. And the SDF is just trying to hold on to their hats and buy as much time and, as, as possible and become a reality on the ground, a military reality, also, but also a governance reality. Uh, and everyone is, you know, uh, the, 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 pa the balance of power keeps shifting and changing, but I think everyone is also maintaining enough of a, 
of a contact with each other to uh, you know create opportunities for deconfliction uh, should the uh, should the heat uh, should the, the you know the the, the conflict uh, heat up even more. Doug, over. what would you like? Yes. <laughs> um, I, mean, I think we can all concede that Syria is just a mess um, and has been for some time. Um, there is certainly a large part of America, we're not sure how much, that is deeply, deeply suspicious of all these engagements in general, and I think Syria in particular. Um, and a, you know, when, when President Trump has said twice, you know, I want the troops withdrawn, that got pushed back from, you know, a, a few, few people in Congress that got pushed back from the Pentagon. I did not hear any pushback from middle America. Um, so I think he is really tapped into a deeply suspicious vein, probably the, you know, the United States being snake bit by both the Iraq and Afghanistan experiences. Um, that is certainly a major trend in American politics that can't be overlooked. Now, whether the American, you know, so-called deep state is able to keep its footprint in Syria um, and enable you know, the United States to continue that partnership. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. We'll have to wait and see what the election holds um, and uh, you know what the next policy is. But regardless, you know, I think the I think the days of maximalist goals in Syria are very much over. Um, and I think everyone now is just certainly from the United States perspective anyway. Maybe the Turks still have maximalist goals. But from the United States perspective, it really is just to hold on to uh, some small pieces and then continue to impose sanctions on the regime. But in terms of having the military base is also a, a very important tool to block the land bridge that Iran is trying to create through Syria to Lebanon and the Mediterranean Sea. No, I, you know, the, the, the tools that are needed to strike that and it's all, we're, we're talking about striking remotely. We're talking about launching drones, launching missiles, um, perhaps occasionally launching a commando raid of some type. You don't need a base inside Syria to do that. You know, Jordan does just fine. Um, so I don't see that as a major indicator one way or the other. Would you like to add anything to that, Bilal? No, I agree. Actually, that's what I was referring to, that basically, uh, you know, if it's all about disrupting the enemy, be it ISIS or Iran, uh, the United States has enough bases and, and, and remote capabilities to do that. Uh, you know, uh, the, the appetite for being on the ground is decreasing by the day. And, and with that, uh, political engagement and, of course, uh, you know, forget about questions of democracy promotion, nation building and, and stabilization. I guess we're still going to be seeing this as it unfolds. It's absolutely been evident to see how the, the United States disengages, who are the bad players that fill in that gap. And I think this is what is on the minds of many people in Washington. And more American people should know about this, the importance of this and how it affects us and and could come back to haunt us here at home, it's very important to have the knowledge about what's really happening in the Middle East. Thank you so much uh, both for joining me today. I wanna thank all of you for listening and watching. Please give me your comments and questions and feedbacks with you, Havy and the Untold, and see you next time.